Um, the three issues that I would like to try and, and briefly engage with today are the first is the issue of transitions, because you will find in many circles they say, well, you know, transitions are difficult, they require time, you have to be patient. Um, and um, they, they say, look at Eastern Europe, you know, it took them some time, they started on a rocky start, but in the end there's a, a, a some kind of functional system in place. Um, I would like to contest that and argue that the situation in the Middle East, if we compare it to other transitions, whether in Eastern Europe or Latin America, merits particular concern. And the reason being is twofold. First of all, that in Eastern Europe, there was a tremendous external incentive, a source of pressure on Eastern European countries uh, or those that are in, in, in government to try and be inclusive and that was the idea of joining an EU and part of that served as an incentive that in order for you to join the EU you must comply with certain human rights standards one of which had to do with minorities so in many cases you had ultra-nationalist uh, uh, governments that did not want to include minorities, that did not, that wanted to homogenize society, that used ultranationalist discourses that seemed to undermine the rights of ethnic and religious minorities, but that had to uh, find the political will to uh, create some kind of inclusive order in order to comply with the requirements of the EU. This is not the case in the Middle East. There is no international signal of any kind to try and um, uh, incentivize the governments of the Middle East to consider inclusiveness. And I think this is very dangerous. The second issue, and I think some colleagues would disagree with me on that, but I, I believe that there is a reconfiguration of what is the Middle East. The parameters, the, the borders of what constitutes the Middle East are currently being reconfigured. Um, I'd hate to say it, but some of the Middle East centers, academic centers, that have had a certain number of countries characterizing what is the Middle East, I think in five, six years' time, will probably be no longer relevant because there is so much reconfiguration happening. In the light of that, I think there is an emergence of an Islamist bloc, and that Islamist bloc from Tunisia to Egypt to Sudan to probably Yemen and Libya will create uh, a tremendous reconfiguring of what kind of political orders will, uh, will be seen as authentic. Uh, and increasingly, there is this notion that the Islamists in government represent authentic forms of uh, uh, organization of society and politics, which I strongly contest here. Um, so that's the first issue that, that I think uh, merits a little bit of reflection, the fact that this is not just another set of countries in transition. Um, these are countries where there are serious concerns for uh, the very existence of these minorities in 5, 10, 15, 20 years' time um, if we take into consideration these two factors, absence of inter international incentives and an Islamist bloc being created. The second issue that I would like to briefly um, engage with is the issue of what kind of power configurations have we seen in these societies emerge? In other words, we know that um, the issue of the exodus of minorities, whether they're Baha'is or Christians or Jews, what have you, has been happening for many decades. The, 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 the specialists in, in demographics have been showing us the maps, the, the numbers and so forth. So the question is, well, what is so different about now? What is happening now that is very different than what has been happening the last few decades? And that is what I'll try and, and try and provide you some qualitative and quantitative data to, 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 to suggest evidence for. And I don't have time to talk about methodology, but any of you who are interested to find out more about the methodology I pursued in collecting the data, please feel free to come and see me after, afterwards. Um, the third issue is, well, so what? What does it mean? What does it mean for societies, for political orders, and for... Syria and other uh, countries in the Middle East with significant uh, religious and ethnic minorities. So the first thing I want to, I cannot emphasize enough is that we cannot really talk about religious freedoms uh, independently of what is happening in the broader political context. And I believe that the, in Egypt, the root of the, the problem was not in the revolution. I think the, the, the youth who instigated the revolution uh, had a very progressive agenda, a very inclusive agenda, um, and were very much calling for bread dignity, uh, bread 
عيش حرية كرامة اجتماعية bread freedom and dignity and social justice there were some variations on that slogan but these were the the the, the main core ideals that inform their vision. But I do believe that the problem emerged at the political settlement stage, the, the stage where they thought, what afterwards? What after uh, we oust Mubarak? And I, I believe that this was the stage in which a, an entente, a compact, an agreement, whatever you like to call it, was forged between the military and the Islamists, um, that the, the, the Islamists would grant the military uh, uh, full uh, immunity from being subject to any uh, financial accountability, uh, that they would keep their empire in return for that the, uh, the Islamists would be eased into office. Um, and of course, the, a variety of, uh, of um, uh, stepping stones that the military helped institute at the, the first year after the, the removal of Mubarak helped uh, ease the Islamists to power. Having said that, uh, the Islamists would have won the parliamentary elections. I don't, I don't doubt that. To be fair, as an academic, if you look at it, it, the interviews that I was uh, undertaking in, in villages and urban settlements, they, they did have a constituency on the ground. But the reason why I mentioned the political settlement is because this is going to be key for Syria. And, um, and this is when the political settlement deliberately excluded a number of groups. It excluded the youth revolutionaries who had paid the highest price uh, in the revolution. These were the people who were thrown in the Nile, who were amputated, who disappeared, who were killed, who were you know, subject to tear gas and, and so forth. So that group which had paid the highest risk on the 25th of January, which may I emphasize, all research indicate that the guidance bureau of the Muslim Brotherhood did not give permission to the Muslim Brotherhood youth to join them on the 25th of January. And that was the day of the fiercest, most horrendous uh, 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 um, assault on the citizens. On the 25th of January, those youth that went out and revolted and who paid the highest prices, these were excluded from the political settlement. So were women, so were the political opposition, and of course, religious minorities. I'm using religious minorities with two inverted commas on it because I would never, ever, ever, while I'm in Egypt, refer to Copts as minorities unless I want to be uh, uh, subject to uh, a treatment that would require psychological treatment afterwards. Uh, <laughs> so um, what I'm trying to say is that what happened was the emergence of a new authoritarian regime. Uh, it is not a country in transition with a political order that has any prospects of building a democracy. It is a new form of authoritarian regime. And like one person said, the problem really is that it's not about the Muslim Brotherhood being in Egypt. It's about Egypt being part of the Muslim Brotherhood. It is this notion that we not only rule Egypt, but Egypt is part of our bigger agenda, bigger vision of uh, governance. Um, I, just to give an, uh, their slogan has always been Dawla Madaniya Zeta Marja'iya Islamiya, a civil state with an Islamic reference. The notion that this is an Islamic democracy that we will produce to the rest of the world as something that is functional. Unfortunately, we have seen the impact of that already on the ground where the separation of powers between the executive, the judiciary, the legislative has have been eroded much to the, uh, with a very negative impact on human rights more generally. Um, and with a variety of other issues to do with governance um, and so forth. Now, before I start on the situation in Egypt, I think what is interesting is, like all authoritarian regimes, you manage to alienate a large number of core group people, which, which uh, is interesting because the Muslim Brotherhood now is in direct confrontation with the head of Al-Ashar, Sheikh Al-Ashar, who for most Egyptians represents the, uh, the tenet of Sunni Islam. They've also managed to antagonize the youth movements, the opposition, the independent media, uh, and religious minorities. And I think I'm raising this because what brought Mubarak down was really a counter coalition. A counter coalition of important political actors that have been uh, sidelined. So there is a big question mark. What does this mean for the current regime? Now, you will find that I will specifically name the Muslim Brotherhood. I will specifically name the government because I believe there has been a, a great deal of wishy-washy 
kind of analysis that, does, that blames it on culture, on society, which I find very problematic. I think if we are going to promote accountability, then we have to name the actors and we have to name and we have to provide evidence for their responsibility uh, for bad governance where it does, uh, 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 where evidence is for it. So I want to now move on to the second part, which is what's the big deal? We've had sectarian violence for many decades in Egypt. It has been getting worse for many decades. So what has really changed? Now, I would argue that um, there are a number of indicators of very, uh, of indicators where we have the evidence for what has been the change that we have witnessed in the last two years since the ousting of Mubarak. Um, and I would emphasize since President Morsi, head of the Muslim Brotherhood, or the Muslim Brotherhood's candidate came to power. I would say that there's been an increase in sectarian assaults, which I will share with you in a minute, that the level of violence has increased, that the modes and forms of violence or assault have taken on uh, new manifestations, if you like, and that the governorates in Egypt, which had for quite a while, or at least since 2008 when I started a quantitative data analysis, did not have a single incident of sectarian violence, are now experiencing new forms of sectarian violence. So uh, again, I'm happy to share with you how I arrived at this data. But if you look at this table, I know this is very small handwriting. It, it, it'll come in a different form in one minute. But um, there has been an increase, 2008, 2009, 2010, time of Mubarak. But you will notice the curve increases dramatically in the last two years. Um, in terms of numbers, um, now, may I just say something on these numbers? These are uh, a serious underestimation of the real number of sectarian violence that we have. The reason being is that I have relied on one source for this, and that is the mainstream press. So, in my, you know, all the mainstream newspapers, we have systematically uh, documented all the sectarian incidents that they have reported, corroborated them, and checked for their validity. So, as you can imagine, in any society, many uh, acts of violence, whether they're sectarian or otherwise, simply don't make it to the press because they're not seen as important enough or because other items assume uh, 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 priority in terms of what gets to be seen as news or because people don't want to report it in the press. So I'd like to emphasize that these, this is a serious underestimation of sectarian incidents, but it is an indicator of the pattern that we are seeing. 2008, 33, 2009, 32, 2010, 45, 2011, almost doubling to 70. 2012, almost a third increase from the year before, 112. Now, if you compare 112 with 2009, you know, all the previous years, you can really get a sense of the dramatic increase in numbers. The, the second issue had to do with um, where the incidents are happening. Now, in Egypt, the, 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 uh, unlike Lebanon, for example, uh, Christian, there, there are no, um, there's no physical separation between where Christians and Muslims live. They've always lived together, in the same villages, in the same suburbs, with the exception of two uh, important uh, qualifiers. The first is Shobra, which is a very large, uh, suburb in Cairo, which has, which used to have a majority Christian population, but no longer so, but it still has a strong constituency. And uh, the second is the upper Egyptian governorates, um, which in, in this case would mean Asyut, El Menia, um, 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 and Fayyum has, has fewer incidents, but it's El Menia and Asyut where the majority of, in these areas you do have majority Christian villages. Um, and these, and of course, there's a, a high proportion of uh, Christians in Cairo, but as a percentage of the Cairoan population, they remain quite small, um, which again is, is quite commensurate with the data for other minorities in other countries where they tend to focus on a particular area uh, in, in, in rural areas, but also tend to have a strong per presence in urban <coughs> capital cities. Um, so there, is, there seems to be that correlation between areas where there's a large Christian population and the level of attacks that they have been subjected to. Um, what is happening is, I think, uh, a slow, gradual change in the democ uh, demography of, of Egypt. So I have been doing political ethnographic work in Egypt where people have actually been now moving 
where cases where Christians have been living for decades, possibly hundreds of years, as in two or three families in a hamlet of majority Muslim, are now actually leaving. And they're leaving because the level of um, social and economic exclusion is increasing. So it's pushing them out. So in response, they're trying to go look for areas where they can find solace in numbers. Now, what will be the implications of that in five or 10 years' time? I think we need to be very aware of because if you do have a change in the demography, demography of Egypt, then of course the kind of policy demands being made will, will change. Um, um, so I, can't I won't share this with you now, but I think what is really, what I found very disconcerting as well is, and this is just an example, um, if you look at these governorates, the Red Sea, the New Valley, uh, El Sharqiyya, Ismailiya, Aswan, uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, zero sectarian incidents, zero. 2011, suddenly you have the emergence of sectarian incidents, which again, I just say, these numbers are underestimate the frequency. But they do give us an indicator that even in parts of Egypt where there was a high degree of social <coughs> harmony, this social harmony now is being challenged and ruptured. Um, it is problematic because, again, it's telling us that the notion that, well, what's the problem that they move from one area to the next is just not a solution. Um, now, um, I'm going to rush a little bit uh, because of time, um, but I want to go to this issue of the change in the nature of sectarian violence. Now, from the quantitative and qualitative data analysis that we undertook uh, 2008 to 2012, um, I, I actually faced a serious methodological problem because up to 2011, I used to have a classification system where I'd say incidents associated with the construction or expansion of churches, incidents associated with gender relations, in other words, incidents where uh, Christian women marry Muslim men, uh, whether of their will or not fully of their will, but that was an issue that always sparked sectarianism. The third is uh, disputes where um, if I'm Muslim, new Christian, we, we have a fight over the price of carrots. I'm buying carrots from you. Uh, you disagree uh, on the price, and then suddenly the whole community gets involved, and it becomes a sectarian issue, even though it had no sectarian origins. Um, so we had this classification system. And then I looked at the data for 2011 and 2012, and I faced a major problem. And that is that we've, we, new kinds of sectarian violence assaults emerged, which had nothing to do with the, the, the system of the, the, the kinds of sectarian violence and their causes that we have been documenting. So just to give you a very practical example, um, on issues of places of worship or the right to worship now, uh, new kinds of uh, assaults are being witnessed, such as uh, telling villagers who are coming to a particular village to worship, no, you can no longer come to this village church to worship. Find yourself another village. Only the Christians in this village will be allowed to worship. Um, now, this was not happening at the time of Mubarak. Uh, I am not in any way uh, saying that Mubarak's years were glorious. <laughs> I have written extensively in my book about uh, how he has been actively promoting sectarianism. But all I'm saying is these are new phenomena. Um, another kind of phenomena to do with the second category, gender relations, is that this is no longer about Muslim, Christian, boy, girl issues. Uh, now we are talking about the disappearance of underage girls. And we have evidence to suggest that it's happening via network and that these girls are retained against their will and that they are married off even though they're underage and that they are purposely impregnated so that their children will be by law considered Muslim. Um, so, and we have reason to believe that this is not, these are not random cases, but there is a pattern emerging um, across uh, Upper Egypt, Cairo and Alexandria in particular. Um, so the third, I think, new phenomenon, and I would emphasize it is new, is uh, this kind of imposition of ransoms uh, or levies on Christians in Upper Egypt in particular, in part, especially in, in majority Christian villages where uh, I'd go in, I'm a, I'm a thug, 
I have my gang, I'd go in, I'd say, right. And, I, and of course, this is in a context where uh, there has been a massive diffusion of weapons in Egypt coming in from Libya and elsewhere. Uh, so people are now carrying heavy arms. They're able to purchase in black markets heavy arms that they can use in a context where there's no security and say, listen, you will, each household will pay X amount, otherwise we are taking your children or we're taking your property or what have you. Um, I believe this is a modern form of jizya, which uh, j the jizya was a poll tax that was imposed on Christians in return for them uh, being able to be protected under the uh, uh, Islamic State. And I believe that it, 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 um, it's a form of economic predation that initially is not ideologically motivated. In other words, I as a thug, I don't care about, uh, I don't want to convert you to Islam, but I see that you are a fair target as a Christian. And I see that the security apparatus will do nothing about me. And I see that now that we have an Islamist state, the Islamists will not care if the Christians are targeted. And therefore, I'm interpreting this context as a thug, that this will mean that I will get away with imposing ransoms. Now, of course, this started in 2011. And at that time, I was stupid enough not to be able to put it as a line item on its own because it was not being adequately reported in the press. So I thought, oh, maybe it's just a few cases. Uh, but then by 2012, we were looking at numbers of over, well, the ones that we have been able to document are at least 60 cases in Samalot, at least 60 cases in Dairut, that's 120, within the space of less than a year and a half. And that's the, the, the little part that we have been document, documenting because pe other cops don't want to tell us. They're too scared. In one case, the, one of the journalists who was collecting the data for me went, had to meet one of the cops who paid a ransom on the rooftop of one of the houses because the man had become so obsessed about what will happen to him if he discloses this that he, did not, he, he could not even meet in the house. So he said, oh, meet me at the, on top of the roof of so-and-so's house. And you know, the journalist came back and said, you know what, I'm really fit, you know, I really ran over the rooftops and got to him as a joke, but it's obviously no joking matter. We are talking here about a, a, a practice that is not ideologically motivated, but that targets Christians as Christians, and that has the same impact as ideologically motivated forms of uh, persecution, which is to tell people, well, you actually, if you think you have equal citizenship, think again. Maybe this is not the place for you unless you acknowledge and accept your status now as a protected of the new Islamist government or as a second class citizen. I'm going to have to run a bit because I, do, I don't want to. But I think I'll just very quickly, five minutes. OK. Oh my gosh, we didn't talk about Syria. Maybe we'll do this in the afternoon discussion. Um, or maybe I'll just quickly uh, jump to Syria. Shall I do that? OK, but just quickly. Uh, People would say, well, you know, we've inherited this. It's a time of chaos. It's not the government. But if you look at this data, it is indicating that actually since President Morsi came to power, the incidents have increased. In terms of numbers, it looks like this. So um, from January to June, we had 43% uh, of the incidents happened then. Since he took power, and this is just six months, I didn't have a chance to analyze the data for January to June. But I'm in the process. I'm happy to share them with you when they come out. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that they have increased in these last six months. But um, it's increased by, by 57%. So um, I think this is, I'm going to jump to, uh, to, to, to Syria. Because Syria is slightly different, obviously, in terms of ethnic and religious heterogeneity. It's much more diverse. There are many more groups. Obviously, in Egypt, the Copts are not the only ones. They are the Baha'is. There used to be a Jewish community, which has now been wiped out almost literally. Um, but there are, there are smaller groups, whereas, very, very small groups, less than 1%. Whereas, obviously, in, in um, Syria, 70% Sunni Muslim, but then 30%, maybe 10% uh, different Christian sects, and then um, a variety of other groups. And of course, the other issue is, in addition to religious diversity, there is ethnic diversity. Uh, the Kurds obviously comprising the biggest uh, group. But what I'm trying to say from the Egyptian example, what informs Syria, is that the, if we are going to rely on the kind of measures that the Western policymakers 
have been conventionally advocating for promoting democracy, then Syria is going to be in a mess far bigger, far worse than the mess that Egypt is in. And the reason being is as follows. Firstly, is um, uh, that the revenge against the Alawis, the revenge against the Christians in Syria will be far more virulent, will be far more intense, will be far more systematic than that in Egypt. Now in Egypt, the Copts participated in the revolution against Mubarak, and it was, it was not a divided political will. I, I, I think proportionally the number of Copts who participated was higher than the percentage in, in society. But I have not evidence to prove that. I think it's just an impression from, what, from, from the analysis that we have from people's anecdotes. But the point is that Copts' participation in the revolution did not protect them, did not make them immune from becoming a target. And when the Christians voted against President Morsi, that, ha that became then a source of revenge. In other words, I believe very strongly from the ethnographic data that I have been undertaking, is that one of the reasons that the Christians are now in such a mess in Egypt is because people would tell them, well, why don't you like Morsi? Morsi represents Islam. Why don't you want Islam? You know, you deserve what you get now. So there is this very strong, on a macro as well as micro level, this sense of you deserve what you're getting. Uh, we will revenge for the fact that you did not vote us in. It means, basically, for Syria is, if you are going to advocate these silly concepts of let's have elections and uh, the voting poll will determine uh, the quality of democracy we have, then the same thing will happen is that A, we will see a majoritarian democracy emerge, which is not based on inclusiveness, it's based on numbers. And B, we will see this idea of you, not only did you, did you, uh, were, you were you against us in the revolution, but you dare to vote against Islam because these groups represent themselves as Islam, even though, of course, this has been deeply contested by Muslim groups and Muslim, Muslims generally. The, the second issue is, I think, which has been raised yesterday, uh, uh, quite a few times, is the issue of homogenization of political Islam, which is the notion that um, you will be tolerated as long as you don't dare defy us, and as long as you accept that we represent the true Islam. And I think this is where it becomes very problematic, because Islam by its nature is very diverse. Jurisprudence is very rich in diversity. Um, um, in other words, there are many different ways you can go. You can go the Tunis way and say you're still uh, observing Islam, or you can go uh, the Sudan way and then people would still say they're observing Islam. My point is that these governments will not be tolerant of an Islam that is at odds with, with theirs, and I'm assuming that this is going to be an even more radical Islam than what we have seen in Egypt because of the nature of the conflict in Syria, which we can talk more at length uh, on. Um, the next hour. The third issue is that, and this we, we saw very strongly in the Muslim Brotherhood. Many of my friends in the Muslim Brotherhood, or who left the Muslim Brotherhood, were, were members for a very long time. So, you know, Maurice, the problem that they were, were facing in the Muslim Brotherhood was, you know, after many years of persecution, in other words, the Muslim Brotherhood were being persecuted by the Mubarak regime, you know, suddenly the movement, the Muslim Brotherhood, is under pressure to share the spoils of their victory. And so you appoint a governor here, you appoint a minister here, you appoint somebody here, you appoint somebody there. And that basically means that the prospects of power sharing, of representation, of inclusion, diminish tremendously. And I think that pressure on sharing the booty in Syria will be far greater than what we have seen in Egypt, although it was quite apparent in Egypt. Uh, two very quick last points is the security breakdown, is that we know that in times of chaos, those that are most vulnerable tend to be targeted, whether they are minorities, ethnic or religious, or in particular, what we have seen in other transitions are women. Um, but I would actually add that with the security breakdown, what is specific to the Middle East, which is different from Latin America and Eastern Europe, is that we have seen um, a trafficking in, uh, in arms, the, the level of arms trafficking that we have seen in the region in the last two years, Libya, Egypt, Yemen, has been unprecedented. You know, people are able to really, I'd, li I'd like to kind of emphasize again this point, that uh, there's uh, heavy arms are being sold, uh, whether in Libya or Egypt, and obviously now Syria is full of it. 
So this is again going to be used in a way that, that makes the possibility of bringing about law and order very difficult. Finally, I think the jihadi network, uh, which uh, I would also put jihadi slash Salafi network, uh, which is, uh, I would say, condoned by the Muslim Brotherhood. We do have evidence in the case of Egypt that the Muslim Brotherhood turned a blind eye to the jihadi activism in Sinai, um, is going to make the possibility of relying on um, law, uh, on uh, social uh, in integration, very difficult, because there are going to be these networks, very well funded, that will have a huge impact in influencing uh, power. So all I'm saying is that uh, if you're going to rely on electoral democracies, if you're going to rely on the idea of let's bring peace, we'll deal with the minorities later, if you're going to rely on this idea of, well, we'll, we'll, we'll find a way of representing them in the systems of government afterwards with respect to Syria, then forget it. Then we're certainly going to end up with a process of extreme religious and ethnic cleansing that I think, given the information we have from Egypt and Iraq and elsewhere, we, I, I think there is a, a issue here that, that there is a pattern. We have the evidence that should put us in a position to say we believe that, uh, that, that we, can't, we cannot pursue these pathways of change because they will be ineffective. They will not be enough. Thank you very much for your patience. Yeah.